So the tentative approval window for the Spot Bitcoin ETF is uh, January 8th through 10th is I think the the shelling point that people have pointed towards is like that's the likely window of approval for a very likely chance of approval. Uh, then we have Ether, I think halfway through next year, which not doesn't have the same level of likelihood that people are, are placing towards the Ether approval, but still decent amount of confidence with an Ether approval. And between those two, that's over 50% of the total crypto market cap. But Ophelia, Kathy, uh, as a crypto optimist, a crypto bull, if you will, when I see two, uh, two of the blue chips get approved for ETFs, my mind goes to, okay, but what about a third? What about a fourth? What about a fifth? Uh, is there a ball that's going to roll here? Is there going to be just kind of a movement of crypto ETFs as soon as we can get some of the blue chips through the, through the gate? Is there, or am I kind of just like overly rose colored glasses here? What, what, what do we think about this? Ophelia has a lot of experience with that uh, question in Europe. <laughs> yeah, you got like 40 um, products, right, Ophelia? <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, and, and so we certainly, we, we, we certainly go well beyond just the blue chips and, and have for a, a long time, actually. Um, but actually, so it's a disappointing answer, I think, because the answer is doesn't know, be, but not for the reasons people think. It's not as black and white. So this isn't a question of, we don't have comprehensive crypto regulation in America yet. We may at some point, and that may change this. As long as you're going on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at each individual product, it depends on what each individual product is, what's happening inside of it, right? Today, you know, some products within crypto are being considered commodities. Some are being considered essentially currencies. They're being treated differently from a tax treatment perspective. They're being treated differently from a securities perspective perspective, right? And we're seeing that. Some of that's coming out of these court cases, but some of it's coming from elsewhere, right? Some of it is practically speaking, what is this thing? Not not all tokens are the same, right? Some of them are intended to be governance tokens. Some of them are intended to be essentially commodities, right? Like there isn't a ton of similarity between ETH and LINK in terms of what their actual purpose is. And I think that's going to end up driving more of this than people realize. And certainly the way it works in Europe is that you it depends. And you're going to need to look at, okay, well, part of what has gotten, has changed is transparency in markets and in pricing, right? And the rise of, of CME uh, as a major trading venue for Bitcoin and ETH futures. Well, there aren't any other crypto futures on a regulated exchange like that. That's a major market difference. Okay, so well, do we need to change that first? Is that actually the critical piece of the infrastructure? Unclear at this point, right? So you sort of have to look at the facts of each product and see where those similarities and differences are. That's certainly the way it works in Europe. I expect it to work almost exactly the same way in America, where essentially it's going to come down to the fundamentals of the underlying product coupled with the fundamentals of that market infrastructure to figure out what can and cannot be put in which types of wrappers. And so it's a, I think as a lot of the answers to these questions, super not sexy, but right. it's actually how you get stuff done. Sure. Okay, so, yeah, so, so there's not like a broad sweeping gold rush of crypto ETFs. It's going to be a little bit closer to like trench warfare, one by one facts and circumstances approval based on each individual asset. That's how all ETFs in America work, though, right? Sure. There's no, sure. okay, all right. Fair that's enough. actually <laughs> just ETFs in America. That's why you have these 19B4 processes. That's why you have the concept of exemptive relief in ETFs. So that is also just the way ETFs in America as a segment have been set up. Um, goes back to some of the history of how ETFs were developed. Europe is a little bit different. They have more comprehensive ETF rules than the US does. So again, those differences in, in how these laws are actually set up matters. Um, goes to my whole like, hmm. it's a product, it's a product of our national history. It's kind of cool if you think about it. It does occasionally can occasionally be frustrating. Yeah, it is frustrating in this circumstance. <laughs> I think a feeling it's supposed to, but but your, your your prediction then you guys are with very very high uh you know confidence uh, Bitcoin ETF right um in next year I th heard Kathy say ninety five percent earlier in the conversation. I probably never should have used that number, uh, but a high percentage. <laughs> going to be jinxing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's not jinx it. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe we'll bleep that out in the, in the final production. Um, okay. And then how about the, an uh, ether ETF? So it has, it does have CME futures. It's gone through the trench warfare path. What's the probability that we get an ETH, uh, an Ethereum ETF in 2024? Do you, th do you, what, what, um, confidence do you give that not to J 
jinx it. And then like everything behind that, it feels like we're probably not going to get anything else in 2024. But 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 I'm just curious, like concretely, whether you think we'll get an Ethereum ETF. I am hopeful that any change look, I, I've said this a lot about these ETF processes. Any change in pattern is a good thing if you want a different outcome. Right? Okay. So, you know, we saw requests from the SEC to pull applications for Ethereum futures ETFs in the past. That happened a few times, right? And then suddenly it was like, okay, no, we can do this. Um, That's interesting. That was also a precursor on the BTC side. So there's some nice corollaries there. Um, I think the level of engagement, the repeated filings you're seeing from issuers, that's very different than what we've seen in other approval processes for the Bitcoin ETF. Difference in process, better chances of a different result. I think if we see continued similarities between the ETH path and the BTC path, I will be more bullish than I currently am, although I am positive on at least getting engagement in that process. So one of the things that has a tendency to happen with these processes with regulators just globally is it takes a while to get them talking, right? Talk to us about it, learn about it, let us educate, let us help, learn about the microstructure, figure it out. Um, that process takes a while. And so at any point in time when they're willing to engage with that, that's a very good thing. Um, and I am, I think we will at a minimum get that much from this process. Uh, so I think we'll probably know more in early next year. Depends a little bit on how Bitcoin goes. Obviously, I don't see ETH happening without BTC. Um, but I'm quite positive on it, I think. I think that, uh, again, just having gotten to know some of the researchers at the SEC over time, um, I've been impressed that they really do want to learn from us. And, uh, you know, I I also was impressed. uh, So Michael Saylor, I remember in the early days when he was putting uh, Bitcoin on his balance sheet and, uh, you know, I just chatted with him and said, hey, have you have you talked to the SEC? You really should, because you do not want to be shut down in your current form and become an investment company. And uh, he did. And they they uh, directed him to FASB. And he did a very good thing for for Bitcoin in terms of now it is not considered an intangible asset and there will be mark to market. So much healthier treatment. So, you know, I think uh, I think they've been. um I think they've been forthcoming in their interest in understanding both Bitcoin and Ether uh, and pretty intensive in in their study of it. So I I, I will uh, uh, Ophelia is the odds maker on this one, but uh, <laughs> I would agree with her. There's it's probably a go in 21, uh, 24. Yeah, better than 50 50 odds, which honestly I'll take Definitely not cool. staked either, though. That, that would be a bridge right. too far, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get oh, there we later. did just get staked. We got staked either for the first time in Canada. That's mm-hmm. new. We have staked ETH in Europe. Um, so just maybe. It feels but... like that could just happen in America. But I guess to the points earlier in the conversation, that's not how this system works. Yeah. yeah. Not exactly. But it's not... It, you you kind of you need the product first, then you can iterate and improve upon it. Um, and I think you'll see. You kind of you need to start somewhere. If you enjoyed all of that, then you'll absolutely love the Bankless newsletter. Join over three hundred thousand fellow readers, all for free. Click below to sign up.